So first I want to tell you about how glad I am to be here. When I came to America, when I, I was eight years old, <clears throat> with my family, <clears throat> I started school in America and I was learning English. So you can imagine you know, ESL, uh, I was always not sure exactly what the teacher said. I tried to not be the last one. You know, I've watched other kids and hopefully I, I understood what the teacher said and just follow what, along what everybody else was doing. It was constantly, you know, guessing and hopefully I understood. English is totally different from Chinese, right? And then uh, one day, can you imagine one day in my third grade classroom, I was nine years old and my teacher asked me to say, Yvonne, can you show us how to celebrate Chinese New Year? You can imagine how thrilled I was. I understood that. And for one day I get to lead the class. So I showed other students how to color a dragon. I was very excited about showing other students how to make some Chinese food. We had Chinese food in class. So it was very fun. And you might think that, wow, how could it be any different? You came from Taiwan, a Chinese speaking country that celebrates uh, Chinese New Year. Well. Yes, the Chinese New Year is celebrated very much in Taiwan, but it is uh, not in class. Okay, school is academic, serious work, and none of the fun stuff. So if you want to uh, cut out paper, you know, decorate for Chinese New Year, you do that at home. It was never really something that you can have fun at school. So here I was in America celebrating Chinese New Year in school. It was such a thrill. It's one of my fondest school year memories. And I cherish that opportunity to lead the class. And here I am again with that same uh, sentiment of being that uh, selected and so honored to show you and share with you my culture. So give me a second and I will share my screen. And some of you, yes, and celebrating Lunar New Year. Now, the first thing I want to talk, explain, is that you might hear, hear me say, and behind me says, Happy Chinese New Year. And we talk about celebrating Lunar New Year. So what is the big difference? And is it the same thing? Well, yes, mostly it is the same thing. So tonight, in the time we have, I'm going to cover five big questions. Now, these questions are typical and will help you get a familiarity with this huge holiday. Now, this Lunar New Year season is a celebration that involves about 20% of the global population. Now, that's a lot of people, okay? millions and millions of people. We're talking about billion, maybe, um, that more than a billion, right, that understand what this is, and they get ready for it, and it's a big deal. So let's see, what is, first we'll talk about what is Chinese New Year, what is Lunar New Year? And we'll talk about where it's celebrated, show you a worldwide, worldwide map, who celebrates it, what do people do, and what can you do to be part of the celebration? So we can start with the first question that's highlighting yellow so you can follow along where we're at in this presentation. So first of all, is it Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year? Now this is a term that has more to do with history you know, historical references and Lunar New Year being now the more commonly used term. That is much more a political question. So first of all, this New Year was is based on the Chinese lunar calendar. This calendar was in use for, well, still in use, I guess, well, it's been used for thousands of years. It's a very old calendar. So it came from China. So in, in the, all of these East Asian countries that also use the calendar, they also follow the Lunar New Year. So now we say, well, why is it called Lunar New Year? Well, it's because most recently in the last 20 years or so, you might have noticed that China hasn't been such a good neighbor to the 13 countries along its borders. So those countries also celebrate Chinese New Year. So in recently, because these countries do not want to be politically aligned or politically associated with China, they like to call it Lunar New Year. And that's also why 
we consider the Lunar New Year to be more value neutral. Now, if you should say Chinese New Year, it's not wrong because it is based on an ancient Chinese calendar. So now, well, let's look at when it starts, okay? It actually starts on the first new moon. The new moon is, is, is a, um, something that we don't think about anymore because it is, this calendar is based on the lunar cycle. So it starts on the new moon and it ends on the full moon. Now, when we talk about this calendar, most of us, you know, don't have any kind of idea. And most Chinese people, if you ask them, ask, when is Chinese New Year? Well, now we just Google. But before, we will have to look at a Chinese calendar. It's not something that comes right off our heads, okay? So if you think about, like, maybe you're familiar with the Jewish calendar, how the New Year floats. It's not always the same day, you know, according to the Western calendar. Well, that is similar to the Chinese calendar. The Chinese calendar follows the moon and the current Gregorian calendar, it follows the sun. So our current Gregorian calendar is rather new, but it is the best, the most accurate calendar humans, you know, human civilizations have uh, come up with so far. Okay, so this Chinese lunar calendar is not as accurate, but in its time, of course, for thousands of years, the Chinese lunar calendar was as accurate as it could be. So it was pretty good until the Gregorian calendar. So let me just show you a little bit. This calendar that you see here, it shows you that, see the ninth is Lunar New Year's Eve. And then the new year falls this year on February 10th, the Saturday. So currently we are not yet at the Lunar New Year yet. So this is a time that people are preparing so up to probably the middle of January in East Asia, people start preparing, preparing for this big holiday. It is not just one day. So we'll, let me show you how that looks like. The lunar, okay, now, so first of all, I think some people might know out there, what year are we uh, welcoming? Maybe some of you know, I have a hint behind me. Okay, so on February 10th, the year the dragon arrives. So currently we are not there yet. We're preparing for the new year. So right now we are in the year of the rabbit or the year of the hare. And if you uh, realize, if you remember maybe, uh, February 5th, 2023 was when the year the rabbit arrived. And so that is similar, as I mentioned, like the Jewish calendar, that new year floats. It usually lands on the Western calendar about the end of January to as late as the middle of February. So this year, the year of the dragon is coming a little late. So it's February 10th. And when the year of the dragon arrives, it will land, it will it arrives on February 10th and it will end on January 28th, 2025. So it's not going to match the January 1st date. So this time, now the um this this holiday it starts on the first or the first of the first month and February tenth was seen like oh is it just one day actually no because remember this is the new moon and for fifteen days when we get to the full moon here that's when we get to the fifteen day cycle so the traditionally the Chinese New Year season lasts fifteen days that's fifteen days of parties of um, uh, having friends over, visiting friends, um, having shows, going on vacation, visiting all sorts, having just a lot of fun. Now, that may sound like a long time. And yes, currently, we do, do not do that anymore. So that means that um, in, in, the, um, in Asia, like in China and Taiwan, the Chinese speaking countries, they will be um, shops, banks, and school will be closed for about one week. So this is what it looks like this year, show you here. So you see, you do not have 15 days off, but you have starting the 8th, so people can start buying things, you know, they're getting ready for the special meals, start cooking. So this week is very much like, like our, our week between Christmas and New Year. 
this is a time that it's probably not the best time to see your accountant or um, your banker or your um, your children's teacher because these places are going to be closed. People will be on vacation and they will be gone for several days and they might be traveling. So this is the time that people just observe as, as a time off. But this is also a time people are spending money at hotels or restaurants, concerts. All these shows are going to be happening and um, busy for everyone. When I work with business people, I tell them this is not a good time to, <laughs> to talk business. You see, people are, are taking a break. So how long is it? I mentioned the 15 days. Now this officially ends on the full moon, the 24th. So there is a holiday called the Lantern Festival on the 24th, and that concludes this whole season. So you see, if you start a, um, preparing for this holiday in middle January, it is a long time. It's So that's why we call this a Lunar New Year season, where we have pretty, uh, weeks of um, preparing and celebrating. And we feel that by the end of this time, spring is gonna be a lot closer. Now, why is this so long? Now, some people might think that, wow, 15 days sounds like a long time. Well, <laughs> I mentioned before that it is based on the lunar phase. So the moon, when it gets full, it is completely full. It takes 15 days. And the Chinese, traditionally, the Chinese traditional calendar before the Western calendar had no weekends. So you can't imagine, <laughs> right? No weekends. So they, they really don't have any... Uh, days off until we come to this full moon cycle. So so this is something else I can uh, compare to, with you on a Western context. And that is in, um, in the medieval times, which is not that long ago, <laughs> a few hundred years ago, uh, we have in the West this 12 days of Christmas. The 12th day of Christmas start, started on December 25th. That's the first day of Christmas. The 26th is the second, and it ends the 12 days on January 6th, which is the Epiphany. So during those 12 days, traditionally in Europe, people also partied and celebrated and ate a lot, spent a lot of time cooking, preparing a hog perhaps. So you see, that 12 days was the time people would have a lot of fun. In fact, if you are aware of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. It is a comedy that's played on the 12th night of Christmas. It concludes this whole season of fun and uh, tells people that, okay, tomorrow you got to get up for work. Same thing like we before. Okay, so, so that's also why Twelfth Night is a comedy that you would not have a tragedy on, on such a special day. So I hope that gives you some context and some, some um, idea of why these holidays were so long. So now we have idea of this Chinese New Year and Lunar New Year and what, um, what is, how, is, how you know when it's coming and, and how long it is. We'll look at where it is celebrated. Now this is a non-religious holiday. It just happens to be the first day of the first month on that particular calendar. Now this calendar was used all over East Asia because it was absolutely necessary. Now it's not until our 21st century that we would say most of the world is using the same calendar. That means like even during World War I, if you travel from America to China, it would not be the same date. In fact, it's not even the same month because the Chinese use their calendar. If you went to Persia or that time, it will also not be the same day or same month because they have a different calendar. So you see, it's quite a phenomenon that we are all agreeing on using the same calendar in our time. So let's look at this. It's the largest non-religious holiday that's observed by hundreds and hundreds of million people. And here is a picture that you might might not surprise you because oh, it looks like most of Asia. Yes, and this is a big time. So the people go on cruises, they go on extended vacation. And some people ask me, well, why is Australia part of that? Well, lots of 
East Asian customers would go to Australia during this time on vacation. So if Australia isn't prepared for it, boy, they're going to miss out on this economic spike. This is this is a time that a lot of money is spent all over East Asia. So it is very busy indeed. And you might see that France is um, lit out, uh, in red as well. I don't know why London, England isn't because I've been to London during a Lunar New Year one time. They had a big parade. They had firecrackers. They had lion dancing. So what, that's what I am um, explaining to you what that looks like. Okay, so in, of course, in Canada and USA, it's mostly the big cities that you would see Lunar New Year parades, celebrations, parties, concerts, and firecrackers. Many people also ask me that, why is Peru red? Now, I haven't been to Peru before, but I do have friends there, and they tell me that Lima, Peru has more Chinese restaurants than Peruvian restaurants. It, and it has more Chinese restaurants than any other um, as, um, cuisine. So they say they love Chinese food and they always make a big to-do for Lunar New Year. Now let's look at who celebrates this. Now it might seem like the same question, but it really isn't because we have to look at uh, what countries um, we're talking about. So first of all, I'd like to remind people of the six Chinese speaking countries. Now this is six countries where Chinese is used as a one of the official languages. So that is China, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, Macau, and Hong Kong. Now some people disagree with me, like China, that Hong Kong isn't really a country, but since they have their own currency and their own flag, I think they are pretty much their own country. They have their own traditions of how to celebrate um, Lunar New Year. And then you, you might have heard of the Tet in uh, Vietnam. That is the same holiday because they follow the same calendar. So here are some flags that you might not be familiar with. So let's see, does anybody know which one this is? Well, this is hard to do with yeah, with Zoom, right? Uh, this is Philippines. And I'm talking about big cities in Manila will have parades, uh, lion dancing, dragon dance, and so, so forth. In fact, um, Philippines is credited with the oldest Chinatown outside of China. So somewhere in the 16th century, Philippines started their first Chinatown. This, this flag is from is Myanmar or used to be called Burma. This is Macau. And here we have Mongolia. Now, Mongolia is something I learned while living in Glenview. When I moved from LA to Glenview about 13 years ago, I didn't know much of Mongolia. But then here we are, where I live in Glenview, there's a lot of Korean people and then there's a lot of Mongolian immigrants. And we learned so much about them. It was such a great experience. As you can imagine, when I was, when I was working at a big company that time, Chinese New Year being a non-religious holiday, uh, many Chinese American employees still went to work. Well, because remember the clause was that if they uh, religious holidays would be observed, so people who are of Jewish culture or Persian culture, and when their New Year comes around, they could go take a day off. But many Chinese Americans show up for work anyway, <laughs> because because our holiday, our Lunar New Year, lasts 15 days. We often just went to the first weekend. We still show up for work. Well, now I hear my my friends tell me that cultural holidays are also observed now, so Chinese Americans do take that day off for Lunar New Year. Well, this year is Saturday, so it didn't work again. Uh, but now, my so when my kids are in high school, I send them to school, of course, right? <laughs> They're going to school. And then my kids come back from school and say, hey, how come we went to school and the Mongolian students didn't? Ah, so now we know they do celebrate Lunar New Year. So this is an important day for people to observe at home. And here, this striped flag is Thailand. 
So this is again, a lot of the big cities will participate in this big extravaganza. So now look at the, the study about um, East Asian Americans. Okay, now in America, what does it look like? Now this is a big poster at my local supermarket, Junbu. And Junbu has lots of New Year foods. And they will remind people that Lunar New Year is coming up, uh, dress up your kids, make sure they visit the grandparents, and please buy your favorite Lunar New Year special foods. And here we have this Pew Research, and this is an interesting bit of statistics. People often say, how could come the Japanese celebrate, I mean, the Vietnamese celebrate the Lunar New Year more than Chinese people? <laughs> Well, it is, as I say, very important for many parts of uh, East Asia. And this low number for Japanese and Koreans really has to do with the, that Japanese change over to the Western calendar much earlier than the Chinese. So they celebrate in Japan, New Year's is January 1st. However, Japan and Korea, people from those countries, they still observe the zodiac animal. So they celebrate rabbit, they celebrate the dragon. So those zodiac animals, those 12 animals come from the Chinese lunar calendar. So that's how they say 30%, 45% is because these people may not celebrate as in go to the um, parade or um, have friends over for that evening, but they observe the zodiac animal. They believe that their zo Chinese zodiac animal blesses them, and they have strong identity with those zodiac animal that was established in the Chinese lunar calendar. Now we come to what do people do? I have five things I can share with you. Now again, there's so many, so many things that people do, I can't possibly cover it all. So if your friends tell you, oh no, they don't do this, and they do something else, perfectly fine. This just gives you a sample, a flavoring of what this, this season looks like and why people are so busy, okay? What is uh, driving their, um, their activities and um, behavior is, has to do with this getting ready. So first, we, before we get there, we want, I just finished introducing to you the Chinese New Year term, Lunar New Year term, Tet. Now I have to give you another term. This is also called the Spring Festival. The Spring Festival is a time we're welcoming spring. I know it doesn't look so much like spring out there, but remember the season, two weeks to prepare, two weeks in the season. By the end of the season, we're much closer to spring. People are looking for the first signs of spring. It is a change from winter to spring and from winter, that cold, dreary, gray, white out there into more colors. Now, while we in the West think of spring color as green, Chinese does not associate green as a color of spring. So that change that is from cold to warm, and it's called yin, cold, or yin represents weak, um, the weaker, well, I'm sorry, weaker energy, but yin is actually literally means shadow. And yang, or yang, or you might have heard yin and yang, yang means the sun. So here you have the yin, which is a shadow, yang is, the sun, and these two energies are constantly at play. In the Chinese philosophy, we think of this is a time we change from cold energy, cold winter, to warm. So the is coming to turning it around. And it's a good turn because we don't like, right, being in the shadow, being in the cold. We want the, the season to turn to the warm. But how do we know it's going to happen? Just think some some thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago, people weren't sure that spring will come back. Sometimes it's very cold, right? When, the, when we had a negative eight degrees, it didn't feel like spring will ever come. So imagine 
people weren't sure what when spring will really come, if it ever will come back. So what they did was that they do these celebrations, rites, and parades, and hope that if we do this and usher spring to come, it will come. So that's part of the whole reason why we have dragon dance and lion dance, because we want to push all that young energy and wash out the old energy, the yin energy. So just to give you a nice visual of that coldness to warmth, let me show you what it looks like in the Chinese interpretation. So the yin is the cold and the gray out there, and the yang is the color of the sun, the red, the orange, and yellow. So those colors are what we're looking for. Green in the Chinese world is considered a cold energy. So we would not associate all of that spring that we're looking for with green. So the first thing we do, so out of the five things, the first thing we do is we're going to get ready. We're going to decorate our home. We're going to bring that red to the house. This is what it may look like. You see our doors will have the character here. The character, this character means spring. And you can see it here, and I'm holding one too. So I want to show you this character because if you think that this this character looks like Christmas tree, well, that's very true because the Chinese character, we look at it for its meaning. And this definitely, spring is a time for things to blossom, to grow, to sprout. So this character says a lot to us about the spring is coming, the time of growth and sprouting is coming. Now, when spring comes, we want that warm air to come right through our doors and windows. We don't want it to miss it. We want to change out all this cool, drab or stagnant air with the new warm spring air. So right now I'm gonna stop sharing so I can show you how that looks like when I decorate this room for, for Lunar New Year. So as you can see, this is a spring character diamond that I showed you that looks like a little tree. It's sprouting and it is from a seed to a, with branches, with a tree with branches. And here we have, I'll show you, a, this is the character that means blessings. It has so much going on here. It means may you have the roof over your head, um, food to eat, okay, and food in your belly and clothes on your back. So it's really hope that you have all the necessities that you should not go hungry or poor. Now, this is a, a very important blessing and we want this to be on our door. We want to be right in the middle so that we want all that good new energy, good blessings come right through. And we often will hang up decorations on both sides, on both sides so that all that happiness and joy will come evenly through our doorway, that we welcome all this goodness to come through our home. Now, we don't want it to come um, lopsided. <laughs> we want it to come straight and steady so everyone will have a good ear. Let me go back to... Now this character, as I show you here, there's also these red envelopes. And the red envelopes that you see in this slide, those <clears throat> envelopes are often uh, given out. This is a way to make that transition again from yin to warm, right? The cold to warm transition through a red envelope, something that we can hand over to each one, each person. Now <clears throat> that, envelope is usually filled with a little bit of money and it's given from elders to children. 
So I would give them to my children and they would receive something. When I was a child, we received something like $1, $5. We were thrilled, okay? We were so happy. And this is the money we would go to a candy store or we'll buy some trinket, or we'll buy firecrackers. Yes, that's what we do with the money. Now, we tend to think like $10, $20. My mom just told me she went to a party uh, with my um, with her grandchildren my, from my sister. And she said that she talked to her brothers and sisters ahead of time and said, okay, we're going to cap it at $20 max. Okay, so so it's something that the um, adults agree on so that nobody gets too much or too little so we can all be happy. <laughs> so now this is a tradition that um, I am not now part of because all my family is in Los Angeles. When we moved here, as I mentioned, I don't have any family here. My mother-in-law, who is non-Asian, she figured out this uh, something. So she went to Hallmark and found these red envelopes. Now these red envelopes were uh, sold singularly and she would fill them with a little bit of money and give them every year to my two children here uh, during Lunar New Year season. Now I think, think that is a really wonderful thing for her to do because I certainly expect didn't expect it and for me to give um red almost my kids that's all fine and dandy but then when we moved here see they lost that social group where this cultural practice could be um could be incorporated so while my mother-in-law participated in this it made this it made my culture and tradition alive again and so my children could experience some of that as if they're part of a Chinese community. Now, my mother-in-law isn't the first one or the only one who figured this out because I found out that Target has, oops, yeah, um, Target has these um, gift cards and uh, Starbucks has <laughs> gift cards and they are, look very suspiciously like red envelopes. So you see, big companies will always help us spend our money. And then the red envelopes, besides the red envelopes, we have uh, oranges. We often give people oranges. The oranges is already in that warm, happy color. We don't have to paint them. So then um, we give them away also because there's two other reasons. The word for oranges, ju and ji, it sounds very much like good luck in Chinese. So to Chinese, in Chinese is a pun. And it's very hard to translate puns, but you just have to think of this as a way to give good luck and just think of it that you give someone something sweet to start the year. If that doesn't make sense to you, just think of the shamrock for the Irish. It means luck of the Irish. For the Chinese, it's the oranges. Aren't you lucky? Now, the dragon dance and lion dances is something we uh, will see. And the dragon dance, now the dragon is a huge animal. It takes about 10 or 20 people to guide it. And then this lion dance, you might have seen this more likely uh, indoors with just two people, so four-legged lion. And this, the dragon is often outside. Many times it's very hard to fit a dragon indoors. Sometimes in a mall, something like that. But um, but you have these two type of dances. Now I'm going to play some music for you so you can see if you recognize this Lunar New Year season music. <coughs> So the music you can see is not something you might be familiar with. And this music. Yvonne, yes? you never heard the music. Oh, should I try again? Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, Thanks. Okay. Can you hear it now? Yeah, I think you need to turn it up just a little bit more.
I still can't hear it. It's louder than me talking, but. Oh, maybe it's something with the audio. Audio. Um, you know, you cannot hear any music. Can you hear any? Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't really hear the music. <laughs> well, can, it, if, can anybody else hear it? Can anyone else hear? It's a percussion? No. Percussion music? Not hearing it. Are you playing it on your computer? You may be able to do No, it no, I'm I'm uh I'm playing it on my phone, which is in the same near the microphone. Hmm. I'll try again. Okay. So you heard it a little bit. Can you hear it better? No, nothing. Wow. Yeah, it's like you must catch the first two beats, and then after that, okay, you can't let me hear it. See if I can play it on my, yeah, let me see if I can play on my um computer. Okay, yeah. straight from the computer. Just like that. Okay, let me try it here. Usually, um, and I have to wait for YouTube's um, ad to skip. Um, <laughs> and, you know, WordPress I site. It up on my, yes, on my phone. Now we have to wait for YouTube. Hang on a second. No. Can you share your? If you can share the player, that may help. No. Okay, let me see. I can send it. Okay. Let me just send this. That is. Okay. All right. And that should help. Okay. Wow. I just, boy, I always learn something. <laughs> Because I've done these um, presentations before, but you know, it's technology. It just is curious, right? Sometimes, okay. Yeah. So this is Sometimes it... professional audio and audio settings. Uh, maybe that's what happened. Because somehow, okay, okay. One speech. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try one last time. Okay. Go on with this. So let's see if you can hear this now. When I 
see you from my you hear anything yeah a little bit now yeah a little bit so this is the uh Nothing now. Okay. Wow. Maybe next time I'll pass this before we start. Um, but we basically see we have had this before. I mean, it worked before. So, and yeah. uh, yesterday, uh, what do we do? Oh, yes, I was, it worked before. And then when I had to do the presentation, it wasn't playing. So, so we have all sorts of um, yep. issues. I hope, okay, I hope the link I sent you will be helpful after the program. Um, but right, and another thing we do, these people do a lot, is eat together. And we eat, it takes like two hours. Okay, we eat a lot. Okay, so this is definitely something to do when it comes to Lunar New Year. Another thing that people do is visit family and then visit the temples. So remember those 15 days during that time, you can visit in-laws, you can visit grandparents, you can visit um, cousins. All this time is for visiting. And you can see here on this altar table, there's lots of oranges. Whoops, how did I go back? If lost my pen okay so here you see their oranges on the altar table and then these two are my boys when they're smaller and then this in los angeles and this is my cousin and her daughter at a temple in florida so lots of temples all all over the place and people do visit and and uh, give thanks if they don't um, go there to make wishes and now is probably something that we can cover today is what does the dragon mean? So this is kind of a bonus question I did list, but think about all of these 12 animals, the zodiac animals, it starts with a rat. And then here we have the rat was the year 2020. And then now we are, we're, we're at the end of the, the tail end of the rabbit. Yes, and we're approaching to the dragon. Now the dragon is almost halfway around the wheel. The rabbit, um, now every animal has animal traits. The rabbit is known to be a good friend. It resolves conflicts and it is a very, uh, is known to be an excellent negotiator. So this is what the rabbit means in the um, zodiac signs. But what about the dragon? The relationship with the dragon or to two animals is what we call a yin and yang relationship. The yin and yang relationship means that they both have their strengths but very different, okay? So very different strengths, but they're both powerful in their own way. So sometimes we think, you see the rat is a small animal compared to the ox, and the rabbit is a small animal compared to the dragon, which is a huge animal. So the hare and the dragon has this, what we call well, an yin and yang relationship. That means that both have positives, but then they are different. This difference, the difference in the contrast is that the dragon is considered a born leader. So they are very highly charismatic. So when they walk in the room, people just listen and follow them. The dragon does not have to negotiate with anybody. So the dragon is considered to be um, yeah, highly uh, sophisticated and so, we might, so you might see that it has very strong features because it's a, it's a big animal. Uh, it has a, um, the antlers of a deer. It has eyes of a rabbit. The whole face is a shape of a camel. It has uh, ears. Well, here we don't see the ears so pronounced, but it has ears of a um, bull or a cow. And then it has whiskers of a carp and it has a beard like a, like a goat. So there are many features of the different animals that come into the dragon being. So you, if you look up what they represent, it might not be the same ones I said, because oral traditions have many answers. So now um, people, now this is an article that came out 12 years ago from 
um, United Kingdom, the Telegraph, and the the comment about the dragon. Now, this is quite a friendly dragon, but the stamp that was issued by China that have this dragon that looks quite fierce and scary. So the article from the Telegraph actually complained about how the dragon's a little bit frightening. Why would you have something like that? Well, in the in in its defense, Chinese explain that the dragon is supposed to be fierce. It is there to protect you. Because if you come into some trouble, the dragon is there to shield you from trouble. So that may explain why you, you have to have some fierceness in this dragon as well. You can't have a weak dragon, you see? And then the idea is also that you cannot depend on your rabbit friend to protect you. You need somebody with claws, you see, like the dragon. What can you do to be part of this celebration? Well, I have some ideas. <laughs> I'm already showing you one. First, since we haven't got, we're not there in the year of dragon yet, very commonly people clean their homes. Spring cleaning starts now. And this this uh, picture I actually found at um, Singapore School District. So they actually passed this out in the school district. Isn't that great? I, I wish they, our school district would do this and remind the kids to clean with your parents. Okay, This is part of welcoming the new year. Getting a haircut. Now, this is very typical in um, even Chinatowns here in America. You'll find that Chinatowns with the uh, hairdressers get very busy. So think of it like um, during Christmas or Thanksgiving, people want to get their hair done before. Right, because we're bound to have some family pictures, and we don't want the hair to be, you know, to be untidy. So everybody wants to get their hair done. Well, it's like that in um in when it comes to preparing for the Lunar New Year. Another thing is that remember those days off. Hairdressers are going to be one of those top people who will have their days off. You know, in America, they probably won't take a week off, but I know several um hairdressers in. The Chinatowns or in Argyle, for example, where there's a lot of Vietnamese um, uh, immigrants, they will take off at least first three days. So, so you see, that's, that's really an important thing to do to get your hair done. Number three is to wear red like I am today. Now, this is not a communist color. Some people have asked. Now, the reason is because it's much older, much older than communism. Red, remember, is the color of the sun. It is warmth. It is happiness. It is the color of joy in Chinese culture. So here we have this man is the ambassador, United States ambassador to Vietnam. And he's holding this character, this scroll that says friendship in Chinese. And, those, and the sprigs that his uh, daughter and his wife are holding is a sign of spring, of blossoms and coming of warmer times and things will be in bloom again. Eat together. Now this is something that I think a lot of people can enjoy together and you don't have to even have Chinese food. Okay? <laughs> you can just eat together, find a reason to, to eat together. Um, another thing that when my sister and I came to America, I was 80 years old, my sister was 12, we found out something very quickly about the Chinese restaurants in America. They have spring rolls all year round. Yes, yeah, spring rolls was made especially for spring festival. So can you imagine that? And so when we came to America, we were thrilled because now it's like having Christmas cookies all year round. It, spring rolls was only reserved for spring festival before we came to America. <laughs> so, so you should also have some spring rolls for spring festival the best time to do it. Now, spring rolls usually have to have some vegetables, something like um, celery or bean sprouts or um, green onions, something that, that's, that has a scent of spring. So it makes you think about spring is coming. It's gotta come. And then we can learn to say, uh, wishing you a prosperous new year. You might have heard of this expression, uh, yeah, uh, the saying before, uh, gong hei fa choi, 
Now, Gonghe Fat Choi is Cantonese. Now, now we, uh, the, uh, let's say the Mandarin pronunciation is Gong Xi Fa Cai. Gong Xi Fa Cai. So, you want to try again with me? Is Gong Xi Fa Cai. And we would uh, say this, or we teach the children to say this very quickly, and they learn very quickly because when you say we reward them with a red envelope. So kids learn very fast when you have a very good incentive. So with that, I'd like to wish you a happy Lunar New Year. Thank you.